uh, everything and I will be the first. Um, if you have been on Piazza, um, I posted a Marius Point review. And so if you filled that form out, um, uh, thank you for doing so. And then we will go over the Marius Points as the first review section of this. Uh, I can see that some people inquired if this will be recorded. Yes, it will be recorded. I will send the file to Adam and hopefully he can upload it to the server for everyone to view. And so the general schedule of everything is that we're gonna first cover the muddiest points. And then after that, we will go along general, uh, generally throughout the lecture material. So starting with access control and the cryptography, and then the last one being authentication, right? And then after that, we will also go over, uh, we will also go over the midterm review. And so with that being said, I'm gonna start screen sharing to then, start the review. So start video. Hopefully everyone can, oh, well, everyone sees my face. Okay, can everyone see the PowerPoint? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Okay. Can everyone see the full screen PowerPoint? Mm -hmm. All right, sounds good. So again, like I said, the topics that will be in this muddiest review based on your guys' response is um, as shown above. Uh, personally, I'll be doing the access control models all the way down to the hash functions. And then Ian uh, will take over from there and cover the index coincidence and so on and so forth until the end of the muddiest points. And so going along with that, um, let's start with the first topic. So. Within access control models, um, in a general standpoint, the access control models is used to restrict information to a certain level of authentication um, so that the user needs to provide an authentication method to be able to access the information that he or she wishes. And so within the access control model, it is usually split into three components. Um, the three components are listed uh, on the screen as subjects, objects, and rights. Subjects are things in the system that can act such as a person or user, or um, in a typical uh, case, it's a person acting on the system. So it could be me, for example, it could be you trying to access your MySU, that sort of thing. The objects are uh, things within the system that can be manipulated upon. So usually these are files within the system, but they can be also other things such as passwords or other objects that are accessible once you authenticate yourself uh, within a certain system. And then the rights are a category where, what are you allowed to do within this system? And so usually this is a subject to object relationship. And so in regards to a file, for example, um, can, you write, can you write to this file? Can you read to this file? And so these are the things that we need to explore in regards to that. And so moving on, um, within the lecture material, Adam has talked about that um, usually this is represented as an access control matrix. And so you can see on the screen here that we have a matrix where P and Q are your subjects, um, F, G, P, Q are your objects that can be acted upon. And then within the cross section, uh, within the innards of the matrix, you have your rights. And so if this was a typical file system, um, you can say that um, subject P, for example, has rights R, W, O to object F. And then you can also read more examples down uh, below on the bottom side of the screen. And so these can replicate rights that are in typical in a file system. So for example, read and write or execute, for example. And so this matrix model encompasses your entire system in that regard. We went out from there. Um, from the matrix, um, that's how we visually uh, analyze or view um, the subject objects rights relationships between one another. However, when we try to implement such a matrix into hardware or software, for example, um, there's 
typically two different ways we do that. And then uh, both ways are called access control list and uh, capability lists. So starting with access control lists or ACL for short term, um, Access control list implements a list based on permissions revolving on the object. And so usually this is a column structure where the header of the column is the object itself and the object um, then lists who has access to the object. And so typically, for example, if there's a sensitive file on your computer system um, and your computer system has multitude of users um, in this uh, style, of the access control list, the object has a list of all the users that can access the object. Capability list is the opposite, in which case it implements a list based on the permissions revolving around the subject. And so, uh, like it implies, um, the subject is then granted uh, rights uh, in relationship to the objects that it wants to access upon. And so, uh, a good way to visualize this is that when you log into MySU, for example, um, you're granted a certain number of things uh, to access. And so, and you're not allowed to access any other, you know, like another student's information. You're only able to access your own information in that regard. So hopefully that is uh, abundantly clear. Moving on, um, from the access control matrix, we also have different types of models to implement. And so we have the four primary models, which is the mandatory access control, discretionary access control, role-based, and attribute-based access control, with each being its own separate entity and its own usefulness within a certain system. So the system, like for example, mandatory access control uh, primarily is when the system controls access to an object. And so a good example of this is what we learned in the lecture of having clearance levels of, for example, secret, top secret, confidential, unclassified, in which case this system of labeling or sy system of clearance dictates whether or not a user can access sensitive material or not. Discretionary access control um, is more, <laughs> uh, sorry, um, discretionary access control is um, an access control method model that it's up to the owner of whoever created the object to um, basically give access to other people. An example of this is listed as an senior uh, system admin gives you access to your restricted company database, for example. Uh, another example is that if, let's say, you make a file and then you give other users um, access to the file uh, in that regard. Uh, out of the access control methods, role-based and attribute-based are perhaps some of the more complex um, access control models. Um, the reason being is because it allows more specific, uh, specific um, titles. For example, in role-based, um, to access an object, it is dictated by the role of the certain individual that wishes to access the object. And so an example, a very common example is job titles, for example. And so within job titles, um, you can be the administrator, which accesses everything on the administrative side. You can be a system engineer, which accesses all the software, code, products, and hardware um, that uh, the, a company potentially develops. Or you could be a customer, in which case the only access that you have is probably like your own bank account, for example. You can't like transfer funds from someone else's bank account to your bank account because, again, you don't have that access. Um, so that's role-based. Attribute-based um, is perhaps uh, a more complex um, access control uh, compared to the others, in which case it allows for more specificity. Uh, and so things like age, maybe your salary amount, um, your membership type, uh, or your department like, uh, is, that is listed can then focus on how you access a particular system in that regard. So hopefully that is made abundantly clear. Moving on, uh, one very confusing topic that was brought up was the Bell Lapula uh, Dula model. And so, um, in my expressions, uh, the best way to simplify the model is the model attempts to simplify the access control groupings of security labels through a symbolic expression. And so, within the lecture materials, um, you will come across the lecture slides that say the security level of L and C dominate the security levels only if and only if the security level of the target is less than the security level that you currently have and that the category of the target is within the subset of what you have as well. 
where L re represents the security level and C represents the category that you're trying to access. And so the best way to um, summarize L and C is that L is the nature of the security level of which the relationship must be lower than the security level that you have. And so because of this, you must have a higher security level if you potentially, for example, want to read um, a object that is of lower security clearance. Uh, an example of this is if you have top secret clearance, right? You should be able to read um, a secret, maybe unclassified piece of document um, because you have the clearance to do so. And so therefore you dominate the object in terms of just security level. Um, C categorizes the categories that a certain object may have. And so in order to access a object with a certain category or clearance level, um, the clearance level must be within the subset of the security level that, that you, or the category level that you have currently. Uh, we'll go into more details uh, within the next slide. However, um, to, to fulfill being able to access the document and to ultimately dominate the object, the object's category must be within the subset of the category that you possess. And so having both of these categories means you fully dominate an object and it can perform certain actions to the object. And the reason why I say this should sound familiar is because it highlights the model that um, uh, within the lecture where you can write up in terms of security level, but it can only read down um, in terms of your level as well. And so being able to understand this, I would say, uh, or at least memorizing this depiction of the security levels is something that is very important to know and is something that the model attempts to highlight in a symbolic nature, okay? And we'll go into more uh, details about that with when we go through the lecture slides. And so the last thing that I will be presenting is the cryptographic hash functions, in which case um, within the cryptographic hash functions, the goal of hashing something is to uh, translate something that is of unique input, so it could be your password, for example, or a string that you don't want other people to know, and give it a fixed uniform um, output that is also just as unique and so that there's no way to possibly reverse engineer. And so this, this is actually one of the properties of a hash function and that for a given input, it should be, rever it should be difficult to reverse and figure out the original plain text. And this is called pre-image resistance, right? If someone uses a one-way hash function, you, the resulting hash function should not be reversible. And this is something that um, is very hard to do. Uh, and theoretically, it should be impossible to do because every input has one unique uh, output. Another property for hash functions is that for a given input, it should be difficult to find another input that results the same hash output. So this is called the second pre-image resistance. Um, the reason why we do this is so that we prevent uh, we prevent um, two inputs to uh, the results of the same output. But and this can be a little bit confusing. But you should, with the given hash output, you should not be able to find another string that results to another to the same hash output. And the reason why I say it's a little bit confusing is because for three, for example. For a given input, it should be difficult to have two messages result to the same hash output. This is called collision resistance. And so two and three, um, they touch on very similar topics. However, three focuses on if you have two known inputs, where um, two or second pre-image resistance only focus on one given input and potentially reverse engineering that hash output to find another input that results to the same hash. And so it will be more explained on the next relationship on the next slide. However, theoretically, with all these properties, um, the hash values are to have a one-to-one -one relationship, theoretically, so that each input provides a unique ID output. And so, like I said, the reason for the properties is so that it's hard to distinguish. And so the pre-image resistance defends against trying to decipher a hash output back to the original plain text, like I said before. Second pre-image resistance defends against deciphering a hash output to another plain text that wasn't your original. And so the reason for this is that we want to potentially eliminate any possible relationship between the plain text and the original um, uh, hashed output and also potentially any other uh, inputs that can result to the same hash. And then collision resistance defends against repeated hash functions 
in, uh, repeated uh, patterns that could occur in the hash output that can be resulted from different plain text. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to, I believe, Ian, so that he can um, present his slides. Um, can can it, everybody hear me? Mm -hmm. All right, All right then. Um, so what, so what I'm, I'm gonna be covering is um, an exit coincidence. coincidence. Uh, let's, let's see, are we, are we on, on it? Okay. okay. We're going to be covering, covering index coincidence, cipher analysis, analysis symmetric, symmetric and asymmetric keys, keys and message authentication codes. codes. So let's, let's start, start off with the, um, the index, index of coincidence. So, so the index of coincidence is just an indicator. Um, it helps, helps us determine how the distribution, how the how the distribution of letters in a cipher look like. So if you're just going to be focusing um, on the English language most of the time, we can see that um, English has an index of coincidence of 0.0667 and so on and so forth for the other different languages. So a cool fact about um, one, an interesting thing about the index of coincidence, if you given a plain text in each of those respective languages down there, um, no matter how you um, encrypt it with a Caesar cipher specifically, um, the index of co coincidence still remains the same. So if you're giving me a, um, a plain text in English saying, my name is Ian, and let's say the index of coincidence of that is 0 0.0667, which it should be around. No matter how I encrypt it with a Caesar cipher using letters A through Z, that means the index of coincidence uh, of the encrypted version of my name is Ian is still gonna be around that same thing because the frequencies are just shifted to different letters. But now we're gonna see how the index of coincidence uh, helps in terms of um, actual encryption when you're dealing with Caesar ciphers and Visionaire ciphers. Um, so when given an encrypted text, you need to determine what type of cipher it is. And given on assignment three, you've had to deal with um, the Caesar cipher and the Visionaire cipher and the Julius um, and Allen test and also the alpha beta test. So if I want to um, determine given an encryption what it is, I always want to first check the index of coincidence because I'm going to first assume, hey, it's probably a Caesar cipher just off the top of my head. Um, so if I do find it in the area of 0.067, I'm going to assume it's a Caesar cipher. Once again, the index of coincidence is really just a bunch of statistics just put um, over the course of many years. So it's not always going to be accurate. So given an encryption, I'm always going to say, hey, let me try a Caesar cipher first. And, you know, and the main way to deal with a Caesar cipher is, of course, on brute forcing. That's all you have to do. And if none of them um, return to give me like uh, an actual English worthy text, I can assume um, it's a, probably a visionary cipher where it's just not A through Z, but it's actual keys, um, actual um, phrases like K-E-Y is like the key for the encryption or it's a transposition cipher. That's when the index of coincidence is um, greater than 0.07. Um, so just know what a transposition cipher is. Um, we haven't really applied it much in class. So we know that the Caesar cipher is an easy encryption to decrypt. Um, but again, we know, since we already brute forced it, we know that a visionary cipher might possibly be the next encryption. So to find the length of the key, um, there are multiple ways. So given on assignment three for the Allen test, we knew, like one, if you eventually got the Allen test, you know the key was around six, or was it five? One of the two. Um, so in the case that you can estimate that the key is really small, you can brute force um, to uh, the key and split the encryption into n parts and solve from there on. Or you can use something called a cask ski method, where you find repetitions in the ciphertext um, and where they occur when characters of the key appear over the same characters of the plain text. So um, I'm gonna see if I can, uh, let's see, can I, I'm gonna, let's see. How do I, um, there we go. I need to share my new screen. Here we go. Um, so given this, given this uh, PowerPoint right here, looking at this slide. Okay, one second, please. There we go. I'm looking at this slide, we see, um, just looking at this encryption, we have to try to find um, all the possible repetitions in this. Like we can see here, um, EQOOG and EQOOG are one of the repetitions. So the Caskey method uh, asks us to look at 
where can we find all the repetitions here possible in the ciphertext? And by looking at it, where does it start? Um, where does it end? And what's the distance between, um, let's say, the, the first O that's over here, right there, and the next O? That should, and in this case, there's a distance of 30, and we calculate all the factors for it. And by calculating the factors for it, um, we might, there's has to be a guess that it's obviously one of these. And so, and by guessing and checking and like seeing like what has a lot of twos in it or what has a threes in it, we can try to guess that our period is probably six. But also we can, um, going back to my slide, we can also take the index of coincidence again. So the index of coincidence um, comes pre-calculated for different key lengths. For example, one is around 0 0.066, which makes sense because then it would be a Caesar cipher, which can be easily reinforced. Two, if a length of key, uh, the key length is two, it's about 0.052, three is around 0.047, and on and on. So then once we find the key length, um, but uh, take um, the ISC with a grain of salt again. Um, in this case, for the example, I had, um, Let's see, going back to the PowerPoint, if they calculate the IOC to be around 0.043, and going back here, we knew um, that 0.043 is between five and 10. So this comes close to the period, so that it should be around six, but sometimes the IOC can be wrong because it's just a statistical measure once again. So it's not always gonna be right. So then, um, then you split the ciphertext into its end parts. Um, going up here. Yeah, you establish the period. Let's say you finally figure out it's six. You break the message into six parts then, because then you know each of the six parts have their respective um, encryption. Uh, like they, So each of those six parts are uh, enciphered by the same key. So then you can easily brute, that, brute force that using a Caesar cipher. So now going back to my slides. Um, we are gonna cover um, symmetric and asymmetric keys. Um, symmetric encryption is the simplest type. As we saw, it can be the Caesar cipher, visionary cipher, because you use the same key you use to encrypt and decrypt information. But the main disadvantage of that is that the keys need to be known by the two parties. So if I need to uh, I encrypt something and send it over your way, you need to know the key. And just the, um, getting the key to you um, is just gonna make you open to attacks because people can get the keys somehow and use it for malicious uses. So that's why uh, asymmetric keys were in, in invented. So it's also known as public key cryptography. This is where everybody has a public key and a secret key, but the secret key is only known to you and the secret key uh, decrypts your public key. So looking in the bottom left, if Bob wants to send a message to Alice, he encrypts it with Alice's public key, which everybody knows. But the thing is, if they would, if they want to like decrypt that, they want to see what message Bob sent to Alice, they can't because the only way um, you can read Alice's uh, public key or Alice, the Bob's message was if only if you have Alice's secret slash private key. So only Alice has that. So she can decrypt um, Bob's encrypted message, which therefore returns uh, hello Alice to Alice herself. So the good thing about asymmetric encryption is that it allows for confidentiality, as you saw on the bottom left, but it also shows non-repudiation. And this means that one party can't successfully dispute its authorship of a document or public communication. So my example below says, if Alice encrypts, a, let's say a message C, saying like, hello world, key, her secret key, and now that turns into uh, an encrypted message A. Now, anyone and everyone can use her public key to decrypt that message A that she created right there, which returns C. So the point of non-repudiation is not about confidentiality. This actually is like Alice wants to uh, like say to everybody in the world that she actually made this message. She wants to prove that this is actually her. So message authentication codes. Um, a message authentication code is an encrypted checksum generated on the underlying message that is sent along with the message to ensure message authentication. And a checksum is just uh, like a value which is added up um, when sent, like in this transaction right here. If um, it's just a bunch of bits and if a bit's changed, the checksum uh, notices that and 
going on to the next thing, it shows like uh, if a message was altered or the origin was falsified. So Max are, are used to create a signature for a message between two parties. So the idea is more about origin authentication rather than confidentiality, like between a web server and you. Um, so if the um, authentication codes don't match, the message was either altered or the origin was falsified. So if we look in the bottom right again, the sender sends a message, he encrypts it with a key K and he sends you the message and the Mac. So then that means you must also have the key and you put it into your own Mac algorithm, which is the same uh, as over here. And it returns the message authentication code and you compare if they're equal. And if you know they're unequal, um, it's either you know the message was altered and if the message was altered, you know that the encrypted um, the encryption with the message and the key is going to be altered or you know that the origin was falsified. So the limitations once again is that um, establishment of a share, shared secret that means um, both the sender and the receiver needs to know the key K. Um, and also you can't provide non-repudiation once again because either the message was altered or the origin was falsified if um, the, the message authentication codes don't align. And that's the end of my section. Thank you. All right, can everyone hear me now? Okay. Okay, so Tony already went over some of these access control concepts, but we're gonna go over um, a few more of them again. Uh, basically everything that's in this PowerPoint should be most of what you need to know for the exam. Okay. So starting off, access control is basically who should be able to access what information on a system in its general sense. So. And then we have authorization, which is um, what you're allowed to do on a particular system. So it's um, a common mistake to think that access control and authorization are the same thing. Um, they're definitely related, but they're not exactly the same thing. Um, so access control is the mechanism for and to enforce an authorization policy. So you can have a, a, a policy about what users should be able to access what information, and that can all be written out you have a predefined set of rules and then access control is the actual mechanism that enforces those rules. And then why do we need access control? Well, you need to manage the risk uh, on your system. You don't want just any user to be able to access any file on your system uh, because you can't trust all users the same. And then just a quick note is that authorization is not the same as authentication. Um, we're going to go over a whole other um, lecture on authentication later. Okay, so modeling access control in this class, we have um, three sets that will help us do that. So the first is the set of subjects, um, which are, these are basically the things in the system that can perform actions. So in most cases, in any system, this is gonna be the user. Um, that's not always the case, but um, generally, for our purposes, it's going to be a user. Um, so we also have the set of objects, which um, can be manipulated by the users. And you're going to want to think of these as files. And then, of course, you have the set of rights, and these are like what permissions subjects has um, over these different files in the system. So read, write, execute, stuff like that. And then, so we use all of those, those three, um, points to make an access control matrix, which is just a matrix of subjects and objects that is used, stored in a system, so that you can specify specific um, subjects rights in that system.
Okay, so there are two types of access control matrices. Um, the one of them, the first one we're going to go over is the access control lists. So access control lists are organized on a per object basis. And that means basically that um, every, every file or object in the system is going to have its own column in the access control matrix. And then within each of these columns, um, all the subjects and users will be listed and with uh, the rights that they have in that system. So you can see that um, illustrated on these images I took from the uh, lecture slides over here. So you have the file, file name, well not the name, but the file at the top, and then the subjects um, listed down columns and their rights. Okay, the second type of um, access control matrix that we're gonna go over is the um, capability lists. So these are organized in contrast to access control lists. Um, these are on a per subject basis. So instead of having a column for every file like you do in access control lists, you're gonna have a row for every different object or every different um, subject in the system or every different user. So, and then similar to an access control list, you're gonna have in each row um, the rights of uh, the different that the users have for different objects in the system. And then another concept I wanna go over was the concept of least privilege. So this is the security goal of providing subjects or users with access to only the information that they need to have to um, perform their task. You don't wanna give them any more um, access or privileges than they need because that leaves, um, leaves you open to potential risks. And then so, Going along with that concept of least privilege, um, compared to access control lists, capability lists uh, will provide you with a finer grained least privilege control for subjects. And why? Well, this is because um, capability lists are on a per subject basis to control the minimum permissions for a, a subject. All you have to do in a capability list is go through every, every um, subject that you wanna um, target. In contrast, if you're gonna do the, do this uh, with uh, access control lists, you would have to go through every single um, every single object and then go through every single subject in each one of those objects. So that's why it's um, easier to uh, manage least privilege in, for with a capability list. Okay, so here are the five different uh, main types of access control. Uh, I'll just quickly go over them. You should definitely um, know all of these and uh, know, give some, be able to give some examples of what kind of situation you would want to use one in, or given a situation, what um, what what uh, method you would use um, to that would fit that situation best. So, first we have discretionary access control, which is where the owner of the file controls who can access the object. Um, that's and then we have uh, mandatory access control. So this is where the system itself actually um, will control the user's access to objects based on predefined rules. And we saw this in the lecture slides with um, those different military security clearance levels. And we're gonna get in more into that in a second. Um, so the next we have originator controlled access control. So this is where the originator or the subject user or I guess uh, file system initially um, made the object is the one who has control over um, permissions for that object. And then we also have role-based access control. So each in this, with this type of access control, users are assigned different roles based on what they need to do in the system. And so each role will have a set of predefined permissions that are attached to it that these users are automatically given in that system. And then lastly, there's uh, attribute-based access control. Um, so every user, in the, with this uh, type of access control, every user in the system is going to have a going to have certain attributes attached to their um, user profile. So users will be assigned permissions based on the sum of all their attributes. And to do this, um, complex Boolean expressions are used um, to determine which permissions are assigned to certain users. Okay, 
So mandatory access control, as we saw in during the lecture, is pretty good for managing different security levels. So going back to the military example with top secret, secret, confidential, and unclassified security levels, um, we have, so each, each object or file in the system is going to have a different security level associated with it. So this can be any one of those top secret, secret, all that. And then so we model this by having LVO is the security classification for a certain object. And then in the same manner, each subject is going to have a security level associated with it as well. So for this example, we set up the security conditions as follows. So S is able to read file O if and only if um, the security classification of that subject is greater than or equal to the classification of that file. And S can write to O if and only if the security uh, classification of that user is uh, lower than the security classification of that uh, specific file they're trying to write to. Okay. So as we just said, um, users are able to read any file at or below their clearance level. So if you're at a top secret clearance level, you can read any, um, any file in that system at that point because you are at the highest clearance level. But if you, were, uh, if you didn't have any clearance at all, you're unclassified, you would not be able to read anything that was above classified. And um, users in this type of system will be able to write to any file um, above or at their clearance level. So users will be able to write to um, files that they can't read using this model, um, because we saw that you cannot read above your security clearance level, but you can write above it. And users are not allowed to write below their security clearance level because they wouldn't want um, classified information getting out to people who are not cleared to read it. And then with that, we have this concept of read down, write up. So this is just a good way to remember um, what, what type of files certain users will be able to access in a system like this. Okay, so going along with that, the Bell Apagula model introduces the um, idea of different security categories that are attached to um, both subjects and objects in a system. So yeah, each file and user assigned a set of categories. And so instead of being defined as only the um, security clearance level, now objects and subjects both have um, the set of categories C attached to uh, attach them. So we say that a security level LC dominates um, L prime C prime if and only if the that um, L prime is less than or equal to the security level of the of L and if C prime is a subset of C. So remember C is the, the set of categories uh, which, can, which are attached to a file and users. So in this model we say that a subject can read an object if and only if that subject dominates that object according to this that rule we just defined. And a subject can write to an object if and only if that object dominates that subject. So here we're going to go over a few examples of this model. Uh, I took this directly from the lecture slides, uh, but so we're just going to answer, go through these. So you can see here, A has top secret clearance and is cleared to um, look at files and has the ACE. Um, what's it called? set of categories so and then we see that so let's go over a first can a read a top secret document with no category classifications so yes it can since that document is at the same level of a security clearance top secret and it doesn't require any um, categories to be viewed a can read that file 
So can a write to a secret document that has um, an ACE security clearance category? No, because A cannot write down as we went over before. So um, if this, A could write to this uh, document if it was top secret clearance. However, since it is below A's current security level, it is not going to be able to write to that document. And then can A read a top secret document that, has, that needs um, NATO and ACE categories? No, because we see up at the top that A does not have NATO clearance. And then finally, can A write to a top secret document that requires ACE and NATO uh, clearance? So this is also gonna be, oh, actually, yeah, this is yes, it can write to that document because um, it is at the same clearance level as A, so there's no issue with that. And then even though A is not cleared for NATO documents, it can still write to them, it just would not be able to read them. Okay, and then for B, so we know that B has top secret clearance and has been assigned NATO and A categories. So can a B write to a secret file and that has um, a NATO classification? But yes, we'll be able to. Um, they're both secret, and they and the file is a the classification category is a subset of B's um, classification categories. And then B will be able to or will not be able to read a top secret document because B cannot read up. So this would be trying to read something that you're not cleared for. B would not be able to read this uh, secret document that has ACE and nuclear clearance because, um, as we can see up at the top, that uh, B is only for to read ACE and is not clear to read nuclear. And then finally, um, can B write to a classified document that does not have any security categories attached to it? No, because B has its uh, secret clearance, so writing down to document would allow um, users who do not have any security clearance to view potentially classified uh, information. So that is all I have for that point. Um, were there any questions? Okay, so we're going to go on to the next presentation. All right, so I'm going to go over authentication today. Um, I'm going to switch my screen. So what's authentication? Oh, this is a disclaimer. What is authentication? Authentication means you are, you are proving, you, you're, you're proving yourself who you are claiming to be. And what is authorization? It is what you can do on a system. And they, are, they both are not the same. What are some of the authentication mechanisms? Uh, there are four. Um, the first one is what you know. Now, that includes passwords, pin codes, uh, pattern locks, or answering secu security questions. Um, what you possess. Uh, it means um, your phone that you used to uh, do duo factor authentication and and what you are is your fingerprints, your um, face ID, and your retina scans. And where you are is um, it's based on location. So uh, let's say you are uh, trying to log into your company server, but the company has restricted um, logins from outside the company 
company network. Uh, this is the uh, this is a template application system. Uh, it is a five tuple. Um, a means is the authentication provide information that pro proves identity. In case of plain text passwords, this could be the password that you put in into your login screen. Um, C is the complementary information used to validate authentication information. Um, in case of password, um, in that case, it will be the hash that's stored on the server side. F is the complementation function, which is basically the encryption function that the server uses to convert your A to C. L is a function to verify identity. So it, uh, you can think of it as the login screen. And when you put in the password, it either gives you true if you put in the right password and it gives you error message if you put in the wrong password. And S is a selection function to enable the entity to create or, or, or alter A or C. Uh, basically, it means uh, if you have, so once you are logged in, if you have rights to change or alter your password. So what, how can you attack authentication uh, on a high level? So the goal for the attacker is to find A, your password in plain text. Um, there are two different approaches you can um, take. Either the attacker has the C, so the hash that's stored, or attacker does not have C. In case where attacker has the hash of the function, function you need to uh, basically find A such that when it's put in the encryption algorithm, it maps to C. In case when the attacker does not have a C, uh, the goal is also to find A, but in this case, you need to basically brute force uh, using the putting all the possible combinations of plain text into the encrypting algorithm and finding if it's true or not. So how can you prevent attacks? Um, there's uh, three ways you can either hide the A, the plain text in case of password systems, you can either hide F, the encrypting algorithm, encryption algorithm that's used, or you can hide C, that's the hash that's stored on the server side. Um, how would you um, hide L, you would ask? So you could either restrict logins to only certain IP addresses. So as I said in the case before, you can not allow any connections that are outside of the co company server. How can you attack the authentication system? Um, there's dictionary attacks. You can try all the possible words in the dictionary and try to guess if that's the right password. And it's easier than brute forcing because it has got a smaller search space than going through all the possible different combinations. And then there's rainbow tables, which you basically have a pre-computed hashes for the size of some key space. So let's say you took your key space as one through eight. So you have all the possible strings that can be just of the size one through eight. And then there's the encryption function. And then there's the C, which is the hashing. So you have a three tuple of those in case of a password um, system salts. So salts are basically random values that are added to a password before it is into the encryption algorithm. Salt is usually publicly known. Um, when you put in, when you add salt to a uh, plain text, and if it's truly random, every time you 
use the encrypting algorithm, it will generate C every time. And these are some of the uh, topics you should uh, memorize. Uh, authentication means proving you are who you claim to be. Authorization describes what you can do on the system. Types of authentication mechanisms are what you know. Uh, examples will be passwords, pins, as I said. What you possess will be your phone, which you use to do dual factor authentication, or USB USB keys that you use to that you plug into your computer to log in. What you are is uh, that includes uh, your fingerprints or your face IDs or um, your retina scans. Where you are is uh, usually location based. And uh, keep these in mind, hash functions are not used to encrypt values and salts are not added to slow the hashing process. And these are some of the topics you recently studied and uh, Adam went um, uh, today in the class, so good luck. Hello everyone, we're gonna go over the exam review final or exam review today. <clears throat> so the first question asks, are hash functions used to encrypt values? Hash functions are not used to encrypt, they are used to <clears throat> they're not used to encrypt values. Man in the middle attacks is a common threat and should be considered. That's true. The Unix ACL is an instantiation of an access control matrix, which is false. See, can I, am I able to write? Yes, I am. In the Bell Lepidula model, a subject S can read object L if S not O. That is true when S doms O. S can read read out. But when when it's the reverse, so O thumbs S, S can can write O. <clears throat> For question one point five, it is the authentic authentication describes what you can do on a system. That it's false. This would have to be authorization in order to be correct. With authentication being rather, or asking who you are on the system rather than what you can do on the system. Perfect security is not achievable just because that new threats can always come about and planning according, we can't plan ahead for new threats to come about. So security can't be perfect. Salts are not added to slow the hashing process. Salts are added to provide additional safeguards for use to users' information from being read by the system. The technical components of security are just as important as the human components of security. There is, they're not more important, so this question would be false. Is there, is there questions I need to be? Okay. 
So for question 1.9, it asks, security is the most important component of the system or part of the organization. This question is a little bit more debatable, but I will, what we collectively said falls. Um, my reasoning is that organizations need to be focusing on keeping the organization up and running. So revenue is an important aspect to an organization's long-term functionality, while security at that point might not be beneficial to, to improving on yet, but only until there's a reasoning to improve security to improve funds. Question 1.10, an effective security policy must counter every conceivable threat. We say that is false since it, there, <clears throat> just like question 1.6, perfect, perfect security being achievable, an effective security po policy must counter every conceivable threat, not a security policy can only consider current threats and not new threats that are in there's always new threats being created. So, so like in the slide before, cryptographic hash functions should be resistant to pre-image attacks. That is true. <clears throat> the output of a cryptographic hash function should all should not be reversible. Hash functions should only be one way, meaning that a message goes through the hash, and now you have a hashed value, or a ha you have some slot where it's hashed to, and this process can't be reversed because it's almost impossible to reverse. That's why it should always be one way across. The access control matrix is used to model what a subject, what, what subjects have, which rights on the objects and subject control system. This is true. As we can see from the slides that Adam posts, or that Adam has, that, <clears throat> that in the access control matrix model, these users are, these right here are you, are subjects. So I, and these are also subjects here, and actually right here are going to be files or objects. So we can see that <coughs> subjects have possible at possible rights on different or on other op on other subjects. You should always build your own cryptographic systems. It should be false. My reasoning behind it was because you would have to place rules for other clientele. So other clients would need to know the cryptographic system in order to communicate. It's like how AS is AS is standard and every and there's methods for encrypting and decrypting AS worldwide while your system is just well, only to yourself and you'd have to give information on how to decrypt and encrypt using your own cryptographic system, which wouldn't be, it wouldn't be easy for the user and it wouldn't be widely adopted. When using DS, ECB mode is more secure than CBC. We say it's false or it's false. Um, what are the three components of security? The first component is confidentiality. This is the act of holding information and confidence. Integrity is the second, preventing, uh, preventing unauthorized access. So prevention and detection is part of that as well. Availability, the service needs to be able to be accessed by authorized parties when needed. So this could be at a 
coffee shop. This could be at the, the headquarters. It needs at home. Whenever they need access, that needs to be available. The <clears throat> interaction between security policies and security mechanisms, the lead administrative body will defy laws, guidelines, and restrictions for the population that is under the administrative body and employs countermeasures. The security policy is a statement of what is allowed, and the security mechanism enforces what the, secure, what the security policy is through a method or a tool. So the policy could be not or don't drive over 45 miles per hour. And then the mechanism would be cops or enforcers. You're a security officer for an organization and your organization has two groups of people who have conflict of interest and they want to be completely restricted in the flow of information between these two. And so there are multiple ways we can look at this in order to define it. So the creator of the files, so the organization, which let's do client, one and then client two. They have their own files that they relegate their own access to. That could be the one solution. And this way they can access each other. So the clients would define their own rules that they can only access their own files. And the other clients can't access their own, or they can't access each other's. Another way is to use the, have the system do it itself, so the, org so the security officer for the organization can do it. So our system, So they control the system or the organization controls what client one can access and then what client two can access. And the main idea is to get it so that the that client one has access over their own information. And then so the clients have access over their own information. So we need to like encapsulate their own data for themselves only. You're given some ciphertext and describe how you would determine if it was encrypted using Caesar, and then describe how you would decrypt. One method is to check the frequency of each character and comparing it to the, the average English, English frequencies. So average English is usually, has higher frequency of vowels. The vowels will tend to be higher, higher in frequency. And then we would compare that against the our main frequency of the ciphertext we that we have. And we should see that there's some displacement between the higher frequency in the vowels of our English and then the higher frequency peaks in the ciphertext itself. And then once we have the frequency for our ciphertext, we can display, use the distance between the higher fre highest frequency, the for the highest frequent characters of the English text and then our ciphertext and then try checking if that displacement matches the key for the Caesar cipher. Question six: you have Public key, and you have a pub, and you have your own public key and your own private key. How would you send a message to Alice so that only Alice can read it? First off, 
First off, Alice sent us her public key. The public key is able to only encrypt. So we encrypt our text. Let's do message actually. Let's do man. We encrypt a message using Alice's key. Because Alice can decrypt it with her own public key later. And then we also have to make sure that Alice knows that it's from us. So we, should, we want to sign Alice's public key with, uh, with my private key or our private key. So we just sign. And then we ship these two off to Alice. Alice verifies that we signed her key. And then Alice will be able to decrypt her, the decrypt our message that we sent off to Alice with her private key. This is, I believe this is seven, right? Yes. I know. So the other, there's three authentication method me or mechanisms. One is what you know, so that can be a passphrase, or it can be a, a, like a password. what you possess, so that can be like a badge that's that just shows that you're you have access to or that you're that you can't or just one of the authentic authentication mechanisms you own. Or it could be like a physical key. what you are. So this would resolve around biometrics. And and other types of biometrics, so like retinal, um, fingerprint, etc. So where you are, this will be like geolocation. You so you could have you have to be in the if the company sets it up to where that you can only access the information at the headquarters, then there would be some sort of there would be some sort of geolocation service that you would have to have on you. So like your phone or some sort of tracker or some way of verifying that you're actually at the location in order for it to be able to work. What are two types of properties that we want from a cryptographically secure hash function? And for each property, explain why we want that property. We want it to be secure. We want it to be accessible. If it is infeasible to generate a message with the same hash value and to find different messages that hash to the same value. So what that means is we have M1 and we hash it and we go to slot, let's say slot one, but if we have M2 and we hash it, it also goes to slot one, then this is not secure and, and this shouldn't be possible. This should have its own, it should be two instead, but ends up being one, so this, breaks the security, the secure property that we want from that system. So M1 with hash one should always go to slot one. And then M2 using the same hash should always go to slot two. For accessibility, we want this function to be 
quick and deterministic. So back to the secure example, that the same hash or the same message will always result with in the same hash. So M1 using hash one should always go to slot one. And that should happen always. <clears throat> okay. So I saw a hand raised. Let's see. So, okay. Did someone raise their hand? Nick. Yeah, I think we answered Nick. Yeah, he wanted to use it. Oh, go back to 1.1 and 1.5. Sorry, I the uh, my screen is full screen, so I can't look at the chat. So we'll go to 1. You said 1.1. 1. 1.5. 1. 1. 1. 1. 1.1 to 1.5. 1.1 to 1.5. Okay. okay. Make sure you full screen. Oh, wait, I haven't even shared. Oops. I can just leave it like that, actually. That should be fine. And then, let's see. Okay. So one point one, one point two, one point three. I'll go go to the next slide. Five seconds. Oh, let's save it. Hello, everyone. Uh, we're just uh, reading your chat and then um, going back to the questions that you said. Uh, in terms of the exam format uh, that is up for debate, uh, depending on what Adam will post on it, um, the midterm review is merely just a template of what he might put on it. However, depending on well, what he, his mood is or what questions he puts on the exam, um, it will be, uh, it can be different in nature. And so us UGTAs, we don't have access to that. So I'm sorry that we can't go over explicitly what's going to be on the exam format. Um, but uh, I would, my recommendation is that if you study the concepts and you understand the concepts, uh, then you'll do, you'll do just fine on the exam. 
Um, in regards to everything that you've seen here, everything will be posted um, on uh, Adam's website, uh, or, or at least Adam will upload it to either Piazza or his own website with the video uh, potentially to YouTube and all of the slides that you've seen here in this presentation um, so that if you ever have a need to go back to the presentation slides, for example, some of you have been asking um, some of the uh, 1.1 to 1.15 questions, you can go back and view those as it is. As a reminder, if you're still unsure about some of the topics, you can always email any of the UGTAs and we'll help you. In addition to that, tomorrow, Wednesday, um, Gabe, who is another UGTA, will be leading an in-person uh, exam review session. And so look at Piazza to know when that date is so that you can ask your final questions that you need to uh, before um, the exam on Thursday. And so with that being said, um, is there any last questions um, to be asked about uh, anything exam related other than what has been asked? Now I'll give around 30 seconds for people uh, to write their question. Okay. It seems like uh, no one is asking any questions. So again, I thank everyone who's joined the video. Hopefully this was helpful. And as, again, as a reminder, everything that will be on this recording will be available to you very shortly. Thank you for watching and uh, well, thank you for attending.